and everything else. And uh, this applies to almost all H2 regions. Will Henney is, has been looking into not only H2 regions, but other uh, densities and temperatures in the universe and in almost all places, with the exception of those places in which most of the hydrogen is neutral, kappa distributions don't play a role. So we can eliminate this as one of the main sources for temperature variations. There is a mathematical relation between T square and kappa, and it's simply that this kappa is uh, For a given kappa, you get the, a value of t square. Somehow the question is, is wrong, but this <laughs> it goes like one over kappa roughly. So a kappa of 10 is a t square of 0.096. A kappa of 20 is 0.048. A kappa of 40 is 0.024. So for on that previous region, if instead of putting kappa, we put t square. We can explain the observations also. Now, T-square is not telling you what is the physics. It's just giving you a value. You need to find out what is producing the T-square. So typical values for H2 regions of T-square range in the, are in the range of 0.02 to 0.12. Then there are many methods to determine T-square, and you can you can compare four or five of these methods in a, in a very well observed object. The t square values are within the errors the same. So it is not a problem of an element or a problem of, of a, an ion. Or it, it, is, it is a general case. So it, it has been proposed that chemical, the Many planetary nebulae are chemically inhomogeneous. Most uh, chemically, most planetary nebulae are, are homogeneous. There are exceptions. The exceptions, I think, are in the 5 to 10 percent range. And uh, we studied a group of 16 planetary nebulae, and we found that the densities that you got from the oxygen two lines recombination agree with the forbidden line densities, which imply that, that you don't have high density pockets very cold inside this particular planetary nebula. There is another problem. If you take the forbidden line carbon abundances and you try to make a model of the chemical evolution of the galaxy, you don't obtain enough carbon to explain the carbon abundance in the sun or in the interstellar medium. So that means that, that the carbon abundances that you get assuming constant temperature underestimate your values and you cannot fit the chemical evolution of the galaxy. Then other arguments in favor that some objects without high density pockets is that the radial velocities in, in, planet, in some planetary nebula will observe of the recombination lines and of the forbidden lines and the width uh, is the same. So that means that, that the, the regions are well mixed in some planetary nebula. In high degree of ionization planetary nebulae that very often come from more massive stars and that very often are type 1 planetary nebulae, you have large temperature differences. The forbidden oxygen 3 temperature for humans on 1, 2 is 19,000. The helium line temperature that is mainly from recombination is 13. Combining a recombination of forbidden line 13, the Balmer, is very high, 20,000. And there are two possible explanations or a combination of both to explain the values for, for this uh, object. Helium and carbon rich homogeneities, or a helium plus plus region considerably hotter than 20,000. For, for 
tumors in 1, 2, for NGC6302 and NGC6537, Rowland et al. Uh, find a helium plus plus temperature. Uh, they find uh, temperatures of neon 5, of 40,000, that indicate that there is shock heating, at least in this object. This is humus on 1, 2, and it has uh, these uh, filamentary types. You can also have time-dependent ionization. When ion photoionization front passes to the nebula, it hits the gas above the steady state value, and some time is needed to reach thermal equilibrium. When the stellar ionizing flux decreases, the outer regions of the nebula become isolated from the stellar radiation field and will continue cooling before fully recombining, creating cold partially ionized outer regions. This might be the case for NGC 7009. You have uh, this object that could apply to that. Then you have density variations as a fifth possibility. Extreme density variations are present in most planetary nebulae, as can be seen from optical images. For steady state photoionization models, density variations are not very important. However, for time-dependent processes, the regions of, regions of higher density will reach equilibrium sooner than those of lower density. Also, density variations might affect the temperature determination if you use the wrong characteristic density. For example, you can determine the density from the infrared, and usually some of the methods that are used give you a lower limit to the average density of a typical planetary nebula. The idea of having shadowy regions, Mathis proposed it in 1976. You might have diffuse radiation if you have a High density blob might uh, stop all the ionizing photons, but from the side, photons, but from the side, you can get recombining photons able to ionize the shadows, and the temperatures of the material in the shadows would be several thousand degrees smaller than the temperature in the main part. The high density knots, for example, in 7293, maybe cover like 5% of the total solid angle recovering factor as seen from the central star. So it plays a minor role. It might be the case. You have objects like this in which in the external parts might be ionized by uh, diffuse radiation. So this discussion, most planetary nebula show temperature variations larger than predicted by photoionized chemically homogeneous model. High quality observations are needed to show if a given nebula is chemical, homogeneous, or not chemical. It is important to derive the temperature of helium from at least five different helium-1 emission lines and to compare it with the T-Balmer. For this comparison, only when, why should use only those planetary nebula where the helium is mostly once ionized? A small fraction of planetary nebula show chemical inhomogeneities that can produce large temperature variation. This is a, a, an important field that is being developed by Jorge Garcia Rojas now. Only about 10% of the white dwarfs are hydrogen poor. A fraction of the hydrogen poor central stars of planetary nebula have considerably modified the chemical composition of the nebular component, like Abel 30 and Abel 78. Other Hydrogen poor central stars of planetary nebula have not modified considerably the chemical composition of the nebula component, like NGC 5315. Planetary nebula ionized by hydrogen poor central star planetary nebula show large temperature variations. Planetary nebula with strong X ray emission show large temperature variations, BD plus 30, NGC 40, NGC 2392. NGC 3242, NGC 6543, and so on. Just a second. Objects with large velocity dispersions also saw large temperature variations, the, the usual suspects. And this is one of these planetaries that show large temperature variations. And this 
chemical evolution models by Carigi and Matteucci indicate that most of the carbon of the galaxy has been produced by intermediate mass stars. This result is consistent with the carbon abundances derived from recombination lines, but not with the carbon abundances derived from collisional excited lines under the assumption of constant temperature. To advance on this problem, accurate stellar abundances should be compared with nebular abundances, and accurate density and temperature diagnostics should be determined. Two conclusions of the six possibilities to explain the T-square in planetary nebulae, the most important might be the deposition of mechanical energy in the form of turbulence and shocks, but there are other minor, or a small number of planetaries can be explained in a different way, and there are minor effects due to other causes. H2 regions and planetary nebulae show similar ranges of T-square values going from 0.2 to 0.12 with an average of about 0.045. And the position of mechanical energy in H2 regions might also be the most important source for temperature variations. There is a, a correlation, the large T-square values usually come from planetary nebula of type one that are the more massive from two to eight solar masses. These planetary nebula have central stars that become hotter than the others and that evolve faster than the others. So it is uh, that lose more mass than the others and where there is more energetic action going on. So if one, uh, one wants to <coughs> The study chemical evolution one has to, of galaxies, one has to consider the different types of planetary nebula to which original mass they correspond, and then uh, use the results to try to constrain the galaxy. And uh, I think that's all that I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Some question? Um, nice talk, Manuel. Uh, well, in your opinion, uh, do you think that there is one reason only for the explain the temperature no. fluctuations or several reasons? Because, you know, in H2 regions, uh, we have found that uh, every got objects, uh, so um, yeah. pro protoplanetary disk, high density uh, structures affect the determination right. of collision right. excited lines. There are several reasons. The thing is uh, to try to, to obtain uh, which of those are more important than others. And I think. Uh, the, the physics of gaseous nebula is going to get you to, to many sources of, of temperature variations. The high density Herbicaro objects, if you have them in your sleep and you don't take that into account, you get the wrong answer, of course, if you assume that it is constant density and constant temperature. Uh, the, the shadow regions, I think, in some objects are present and in others are not. The ones that are uh, density bounded maybe do not show this problem, but the ones that are ionization bounded do show problems of shadow, shadows. So I think what, what one has to do is to, to look at each object individually and see what's going on in that object and not assume that all the other objects are well known or well chemically mixed and have the same abundances. Because if you do that, you, you get the, the wrong answer for, for general questions. You have to pin down each object and see what's going on. I have another question. In your opinion, what is the limit of the abundance discrepancy to say, uh, in planets and nebula, to say that you need uh, uh, two, uh, several components? I think if the velocity is, is very small, you, you might favor chemical inhomogeneities. If the velocities are very high, then you have to, to think in shocks, you have to think in turbulence. 
And I don't know how to think on magnetic reconnection. You see all these objects and they have filaments and they have a structure that has to have an origin. And what is producing all these magnificent and beautiful shapes of some planetary nebula? No one has to understand how these shapes are formed. And shocks might, might small velocity shocks, not very high velocity shocks. I have something to do with it. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Manuel, going back to my talk yesterday, when they <laughs> included the effects of turbulence in the in the uh, photosphere, that affected the abundances. I mean, that made a change, but the abundances went down rather than up. Mm -hmm. So. This is the effect, you, you want to hear the opposite effects. See, here we are, the, almost everything gets, the, the opponents is going higher. I think, well, it's, a, it's the way the emissivity goes as a function of temperature. And <clears throat> so what we need is, is to, to explain what is causing the high temperatures and what is causing the low temperatures. That's the, the, if you are doing statistical works, if you are doing individual work, it's very, very important to try to use recombination lines only and, and, not, uh, and not to combine with what you get from forbidden lines. But if you are working with extragalactic objects or with very faint objects, you only have the forbidden lines. And there is a paradox here. If you try to fit the nebular lines, you get better answers and if you try to use the aurora lines, because the aurora lines depend much more on the temperature. And it was thought in the past that once you had the aurora lines, you really knew the temperature. And this is not the case. It is better to use only the nebular lines and maybe a model to get an abundance. So it, it, it's paradoxic because it is very difficult and very time consuming to get the intensity of the aurora lines. But they depend a lot on the temperature. So they are, they are giving you the wrong answer if you're assuming a constant temperature situation. Thanks. Other question, commentary? No? Well, we thanks Manuel again. And, and uh, Manuel did a shorter talk to give the opportunity to Gary to have some comments on this topic. <coughs> Thank you. I want to show I was having lunch with Antonio a few days ago. We were talking about T squared, and he was reminiscing about being a child and the very rugged road that uh, the Pemberts had convincing the astronomical community that T squared was real. And I said, well, you know, I, I organized a meeting, and this is the very meeting where Mike Seaton said for the very first time that he believed that T squared was real. So I want to tell you about that. So if you're into, you know, the, the small the small part of nebular astrophysics that we hold dear, this was really a, an important time the day that, that Mike Seaton said that T-squared was real. The, the meeting was in uh, the summer of 1994, and it was in honor of the 70th birthdays of Mike Seaton on the left and Don Osterbrock on the right. So these are the two of them that are in Lexington. There's uh, in back of it, there's a statue of Man of War winning a horse race uh, the horse race, the thoroughbred racehorse industry is very, very big industry in Lexington. That's my wife works in in that industry. Uh, we went on several horse farm tours. Uh, the two of them, and uh, the two of them, had started collaborating in the early 1950s. Uh, Don Osterbrock had left Princeton and was hired by Greenstein at Pasadena, and he said he had the best telescope in the world, the 200 inch. He had the best. Spectrograph in the world that Bowen had built a spectrograph, a nebular spectrograph. He needed the best theory in the world, and he'd seen Seton's quantum defect papers coming out. He wrote uh, Seton a letter cold in the early 1950s, and they started a collaboration. Seton could not visit Don in the States. Seton was a communist at the time, and it was illegal for a communist to come into the United States. Eventually, they did meet in the 60s, but before they had met, they wrote the, a, a famous AppJ paper, which uh, uh, did the first O3, uh, the O2 density diagnostic. So the, the, uh, as 
the mic was very, very important to me. For some reason, he decided he liked me. So when I was living in England, and we visit him every few months, so he'd be sitting and he had a very tiny office, and he always had a pipe, so you'd see him back behind the haze. And I would uh, ask him from time to time various questions. And uh, you know, one of the important tools all British professors have, if you ask a, a difficult question, you answer a question with a question. And when I asked him about T squared, he would always say, well, I wonder what good observations and, and good atomic data would show. And so he was uh, skeptical because he had spent about 10 years in the 60s trying to interpret very high-end Balmer lines, which were in fact were due to badly uh, reduced photographic spectra. So he uh, 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 was, was always great fun. I had many evenings with pubs. The thing we often talked about uh, was, was airplanes. He loved to talk about his days in the RAF. He had an astonishing series of, of paper of stories about his adventures in the RAF. One of the most famous had the punchline that Mike Seaton always did his calculations as if his life depended on it. Uh, this was the meeting. It was very, uh, the, the field is very collegial. We all had codes. And normally you think different pe people, different codes, you get into a big fight over who's right. That's not how it works in this field. We got together as sort of like a 12-step program. My name is Gary and my code has bugs. Uh, this is, uh, two people are here. Here's Ravi and here's Luke. Uh, some of the more high points here are the modelers. Here's Haggai Netzer, uh, Tim Coleman, that's me, Don, Mike, uh, John Raymond, uh, Pat Harrington, these are, uh, uh, Ralph Sutherland works with Mike Dapita. Uh, the late, late Bob Rubin, he took these photos. Uh, this may or may not be Barbara Ecolano. Does anybody know? Someone? I, I don't. I don't know that. Okay. So uh, uh, it was a, a fantastic meeting. We we uh, had a, uh, made a lot of progress. We established your benchmark models. If we all use the same atomic data, uh, we should all get the the same answer and uh, no no fights of, of huge egos. Uh, there are a series of talks. Now, this is not. This slide does not come across very well because of the glare. Uh, uh, this is days when we used overhead projectors. If you look very carefully at what uh, is on the left, uh, this is Mike giving his talk, and on the left he's wor slowly working his way through uh, recombinations theory. So he talks about Burgess, 1959. Burgess, Alan Burgess, was his student at UCL. This is Burgess and Burgess and Summers. So Summers was Alan Burgess's student at, uh, uh, at, at Cambridge, and it, it goes through a series of uh, working his way up. So what he's doing is working his way through recombination theory, because people had noticed, even in the 1940s, that there are some very strong heavy element recombination lines in planetary nebulae. Now, Mike Seaton always did his calculations as if the, uh, his life depended on it, and there's an, an expression he would use, you, uh, I, I want to be able to stand by this number, meaning you stand up for it. And he, he's working through all the possibilities, what can go wrong in recombination theory. On the right, you can see QTT, that's quantum defect theory. He was a master at, you know, when you want to solve many body quantum mechanics, that's hard work. He was the master at taking the available machinery, making the right approximation so that he could solve the problem on the machine he had that year. So he's he worked all the way through it, and then he basically said, well, I, I think this is the process but where these O2 recombination lines, these permitted lines, well, the O2 permitted lines in the spectrum, he said, are, are forming by... Uh, by dielectric recombination. The statue of this man in this field, it cannot be under, underestimated. I went to a, a meeting once and he was there and he got up to, to excuse himself from the meeting and he walked out the door and the meeting stopped. No one wanted to be presenting anything while Seton was out of the room. So Harry Nussbaumer said, uh, uh, we shall wait for the return of the Pope. El Papa, and Mike came back in, and, and, the, and the meeting continued. So where he ended with this is he said he he under he think he said he's prepared to stand by how these lines form, and uh, he said that, that this really is data chart recombination. It's by a process we can compute. He had computed it, and he said that uh, the abundances in this planetary nebula really is an order of magnitude higher than you get from the forbidden lines. And then he said. 
Uh, he had long been very, uh, very skeptical of the idea of temperature fluctuations and nebulae, and he said uh, uh, the, 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 clearly that uh, he'd come to accept it, that temperature fluctuations were, were clearly present in this nebula. And so this was an, an hour-long talk that he, that he had given. I was uh, a little bit shocked I didn't say anything at that point. And when his talk was over and his coffee, I walked up to him and said, Mike, did you just say you accepted temperatures, T, t squared? And he said, yes, T squared's for real. So, so that was the, the day Mike, Mike Seaton uh, signed on to T squared. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot for these historical comments. <laughs> so we changed computer. And we will have the next talk by Miriam Peña. Okay. Uh, good morning. This is the last day. So I'm going to present here a work with we have been doing along the years with all these people, Sheila, Jorge, Liliana, Mike, Richard, Racina, Stasinska. All of them are here. So <laughs> if I tell lies, they could correct me. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk about planetary nebulae in external galaxies, in particular these three galaxies, NGC 300, NGC 3109, and NGC 6822. Okay, uh, great, great efforts have been devoted to detect and analyze planetaries in nearby galaxies. And why is this? Because these objects are good tracers of their Parent population, which are low and intermediate mass stars formed a few years, decades, years ago. Uh, this planetary is allowed to analyze the, chemi the, kinematical, the kinematics and the chemistry of the progenitor star and its evolution, and also the chemical composition of the interstellar medium of the host galaxy. Also, they are useful for distant determinations. Uh, in this talk, I would refer mainly to this second uh, importance of planetaries. Uh, spectroscopically, these objects have been analyzed in galaxies in the local group and beyond. Here are some examples. And here I present the studies, as already said, in NGC 300, which is a spiral, and two irregular galaxies of the local group. Uh, first, we search for PN candidates and we detect these candidates in these galaxies by, Im by imaging in uh, oxygen 3, 507, and H alpha using one of band filters. And we perform follow up spectroscopy with large telescopes, uh, DLT, Magellan, GTC, the Canarian telescope, using different kinds of spectrograph. The idea was to determine this oxygen-3 temperature sensitive ratio to determine the temperature in these objects. I'm very sad to hear from Manuel that this is not good anymore. <laughs> How is it possible? <laughs> How is it possible? <laughs> OK, so uh, we have some criteria to select PN candidates in order to not confuse them with compact H2 regions. And our criteria proved to be adequate 
the majority of our selected PN candidates were confirmed as PN uh, planetaries in the spectroscopy. Uh, okay, for NGC 6822, we have 18 planetaries and several compact texture regions. For NGC 0109, we have nine planetaries. And for NGC 300, we have 20 planetaries and several compact texture regions. And we determine chemical abundances, first ionic abundances, compute on the base of the temperature we determine with the oxygen sensitive ratio of temperature and the density of sulfur lines. And after that, we derive total abundances using semi empirical methods, assuming ionization correction factors by Kingsford Barrow and more recently uh, the ICF of Delgado and Glad. So we have errors in this chemical abundances, typically of the order of 0.2 decks. The first, the first galaxy NGC 6822. This is an irregular. It, it's in the halfway between Andromeda and the Milky Way. It has a metallicity similar to the LMC. Very active star formation. Has a lot of A2 regions. Uh, here we are showing the central part, which is uh, apparently an it is an optical bar. The galaxy is much larger than this. It has a huge disk, hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, and also a huge spheroidal of um, carbon stars. Uh, here we detect 26 PN candidates reported in this work, and we analyze 18. Spectroscopically, we analyze 18 of these candidates, and we find two kinds of PN populations. The, in blue, there are planetaries belonging to a young population, and in pink, here, there are planetaries belonging to an older population. The results of this work were published in several works here. Now I'm going to review the abundances, the chemistry in this in these objects, mainly the neon to oxygen abundances, and also the uh, the nitrogen. In this case, I'm showing the a graph with the nitrogen to oxygen abundance plotted against the oxygen abundance. In black, we have here the planetaries. In red, we have the compact to regions we analyzed here. And what we found is that we have sort of two kind of populations, an old one population with oxygen abundance lower than eight in this scale or in this scale, and a younger population with oxygen abundance is similar to H2 regions. And in uh, relative to the nitrogen, to oxygen abundance, planetaries are richer than H2 regions, which is normal in, in most of the samples of planetary nebulae. In this plot, we have overlap models of stellar evolution for this low intermediate mass stars. Uh, for different metallicities. Here above, we have Caracas 2010 models showing the behavior of the models with different initial masses. Uh, and in the second graph, we have the same, but with models by Ventura et al. In the case of models by Caracas, we found that our planetaries go in the metallicity range from very low metallicity to metallicities similar to the uh, 0.004. It is this magenta thing here. And this is similar to the metallicity of the small Magellanic cloud. What we found in these models is that, uh, OK, uh, we have several planetaries with low nitrogen to oxygen, which are not reproduced by the models by Caracas. 
In the case of models by Ventura, the, we have here two sort of models, 0.001 and 0.004. And we found that these models here, especially in this part of low nitrogen, nitrogen to oxygen abundance, we find that Ventura models are produced better, the, the observations. What else? We have very nitrogen-rich planetaries in this zone. Those correspond to type one planetaries, planetary nebula in this galaxy, and we have two of them in the low metallicity regime and two of them in the high metallicity regime. So the conclusion is that type ones planetaries occur, occur at any metallicity. No, not necessarily in the high metallicity regime. And these planetaries should have had an initial mass uh, of from three to four solar masses. In the case of neon here, we again have uh, in, in, this, in this axis, I have the neon, to, the neon ratio, the, the uh, neon abundance, neon to hydrogen, and here the oxygen to hydrogen. Okay, and the models are again overlapped. Uh, what is interesting here is that neon and oxygen grows in locksteps, which is a known thing for planetaries and for H2 regions. Uh, the models of Caracas from, with, with metallicity from 0, 0, 0, 0.001 to 0, 0.004 do reproduce the data, but the models by Caracas 2010 predict too much, too much neon uh, for the objects, especially if the initial masses of the stars were uh, above 2 to 2.53 solar masses, and we don't find objects in that zone. Uh, what else? Uh, here we have the models, the same graph with the models by Ventura et al. And we find that Ventura et al. models do predict or reproduce better our, our observations. So in this case, the models by Caracas, uh, to our opinion, are producing too much neon. In this phenomena that is very interesting, the neon is enriched due to two alpha captures of nitrogen 14, producing neon 22. The other irregular latest spiral NGC 3109. Uh, this work was presented in a poster by Flores Duran. This meeting, I hope all of you saw this poster. It is not there already, but, but Chayla is there, so you can ask, talk to her. Okay, this is the dominant galaxy in the, in the Antlan sextant group. It's at the distance of one point 1.3 megaparsec, it's very low metallicity, very low metallicity from A2 regions, is similar to the NCMC. Okay, we uh, detect 20 planetaries here, are in green in this graph, and in magenta we have some compact A2 regions, and we performed follow-up spectroscopy of 10 of the planetaries, and here are the results. Again, here is a graph showing nitrogen to oxygen ratio versus oxygen. And in black, there are the planetary nebulae. In squares, open squares, are the H2 regions. What is interesting, very interesting here, is that the planetaries are oxygen rich relative to the A2 regions by about 0.2 desk. All the planetaries, or most of the planetaries, are showing oxygen and rich relative to the A2 regions. We already have put here the models by Caracas 2010, and what we found from the models is that uh, they do not produce oxygen enrichment. These objects here, our planetaries, are reproduced by a large, by models with large metallicity. And uh, so these models by Caracas are not producing enrichment. Uh, again, the 
very massive uh, planetaries with very massive stars, initial mass stars, should be very nitrogen rich. And we have only one object here with this very large nitrogen to oxygen ratio, which should have a mass larger than two solar masses at the beginning. Here we have the models by Ventura, by Ventura et al. And again, we found that these models reproduce better our observations in the sense that these models seem to have predicting oxygen enrichments in these planetaries, in these stars. And what about neon? Here we have the neon. Again, neon and oxygen grows in lockstep. Uh, again, we are seeing that here are the H2 regions, here are the planetaries. The planetaries are oxygen richer than the H2 regions. And again, the models by uh, Caracas are predicting too much neon for stars with initial masses between 2, 2.53 solar masses. The models by Ventura are reproducing better our, our uh, data. Anyway, there are a couple of objects here with very low, very low neon that are not reproduced by any of the models. The other galaxy, NGC 300, I put this picture from Messenger. It's such beautiful that I cannot avoid it. Okay, <laughs> this galaxy is a late spiral galaxy in the sculpture group. It is at a distance of about two megaparsec, and it has a central metallicity, 8.57, and there is an abundance gradient in metallicity in this spiral as there is in most of spirals. We analyzed the two zones. We searched for emission line objects in this central zone and in a zone in the periphery. And we detect about 100 objects, PN candidates, uh, which are shown here. Here we have our PN candidates, and we perform follow up spectroscopy for about 30 of this object. Oh, how is my time? Come away. Okay. Okay, so uh, here we are showing some graph where we separate planetaries from H2 regions, and we see that planetaries behave differently from H2 regions, especially in what is uh, relative to the nitrogen to oxygen abundance, and also the neon to oxygen is showing here. The neon to oxygen for planetaries is slightly larger than what is found for um, H2 regions. The other elements like sulfur and argon don't show this, short, this kind of behavior. Neon to oxygen in this 30, about 30 planetaries. Again, the planetaries are nitrogen richer than the H2 regions, which are in green here. The planetaries are in black. The planetaries are nitrogen richer. Uh, the models, again, by Caracas. In this case, Caracas is the blue one. Ventura are these red stars here. And what we found is that Ventura, Ventura models going from small one solar masses, two, three, whatever, four, five, six solar masses in the red, the red line here. These Ventura models are predicting or are reproducing better our observations, reproducing these planetaries with lower nitrogen to oxygen ratio. We have very a very rich planetary here, which is a type one, which should have had an initial mass of about four. The central star, four solar masses, should have been the 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 mass of the central star. Relative to neon, uh, what we have in green are the 
H2 regions and in black, the planetaries. The planetaries, here we have neon versus oxygen. So the planetaries are showing more neon than the H2 regions. The models by Caracas here are the blue ones. Again, they are predicting too much neon. The models by Ventura do reproduce better our observations. Uh, again, we have a relation neon to oxygen growing in lockstep here. And again, we have the same planetaries with very low neon that are not reproduced by models. What can we say more of this galaxy? We uh, analyze the gradients of chemical composition. This is the gradient of oxygen. This is the oxygen abundance abundance against the distance to the galactic center. And in blue, sorry for the change of colors. <laughs> in blue, we have the H2 regions. In red, we have the behavior of planetaries. So there is a clear gradient here in oxygen for the H2 regions. It's similar to the one who was reported by Bresolin. Uh, but in the case of planetaries, what we have is that at a given radius, they show very dispersed oxygen abundance, and the gradient for the planetaries is flatter. It's flatter than what is for the uh, H2 regions. So in this case, we have many central stars with lower oxygen abundance in the central part than the oxygen abundance in uh, H2 regions. And what is, what is the cause? It could be that these planetaries belong to an old population, and also migration could be affecting the behavior of oxygen versus, or the gradient of oxygen from planetaries, because all planetaries could have moved from their original position in the galaxy and flattening the gradient. So uh, in several spiral galaxies, this is found, uh, other gradients, okay. We're going to the discussion. Or in several spiral galaxies, like this one, M31, M32, M81, and even the Milky Way, the oxygen to the abundance gradient of oxygen for planetaries are flatter than what is found for A2 regions. And in, this has been interpreted by other authors as in the past, the gradients were flatter and they're steepening with time. However, now we are finding that there, there is production of oxygen and neon in the central stars of this planetary, which could be modifying the abundance and the gradients could appear flatter. Also, migration could be flattening the gradients in these spirals. Therefore, oxygen and neon abundances are not adequate or are inadequate for analyzing the original interstellar medium in spiral galaxies and probably argon and sulfur, which are very complicated, but probably argon and sulfur gradients should be analyzed better. And my conclusions. What have we learned from this extragalactic planetary nebulae? Well, the oxygen, the oxygen enrichment and the neon to oxygen behavior in the planetaries in this very low metallicity irregular galaxy confirms that at low metallicity central stars do dredge up oxygen and neon. So probably only sulfur and argon and other alpha elements could give information about the original interstellar medium abundances. Uh, the same is occurring at high metallicity, not only in this very low metallicity galaxy, but also in these galaxies, NGC 6822, NGC 300, and the Milky Way, which have higher metallicities, but planetary nebulae or samples of planetary nebulae are oxygen and neon enriched. In several spiral galaxies, oxygen abundance gradients for planetaries are flatter than the gradients shown by it, by it to regions. Uh, elemental production in the central stars and migration 
in the galaxy are possible causes for such a behavior. We don't find evidence, we don't find evidence that gradients are steepening with time as it has been said by other authors. Uh, we have compared models of star evolution with the observations. And what we find is that the standard models by Caracas predict too much neon enrichment via the two alpha captures of nitrogen 14. Non-standard models by Ventura that reproduce better the observations. And that's all, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Miriam. Any questions, comments? Are there similar, similar studies for Andromeda galaxy? Uh, sure. <laughs> and how do they compare with what you have? In, I, I don't know about the neon abundances and that part, the, 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 the gradient mm -hmm. given by planetaries are flatter in mm -hmm. Andromeda than the one given for the two regions. Okay, thank you. They couldn't do the numbers uh, in my head, relative to the Orion or the Sun, what are the highest metallicity H2 regions you find? In the Milky Way. And in no, the abundance yeah, gradients, and the highest, and you follow the gradient into the center. No, I, I, which is the gradient in the galaxy? I think the, this, the, uh, the gradient slopes are similar. But, but what, what's the highest metallicity you get in towards? The absolute yellow in the, in the center of the of the Milky Way. It point no more. Eight point five is in the in the solar neighborhood. So eight point eight. I think it's eight point eight. Eight point eight. I don't, I don't use those numbers relative to the Sun or or, or, the, or Orion. How high is it? The Sun or Orion has oxygen about eight point seven. Just, just epsilon above Orion, so you don't yeah. see metal-rich H2 regions. In the center, they are richer. In the center richer, of the but not, say, two or three times solar. No, no. Is that no, expected? No. Wouldn't you, from, from abundance gradients, wouldn't you expect to get up to a few times solar in the center of a grand design spiral? I don't know. Where is Leticia Carigi? She prepares models <laughs> of chemical enrichment of the gradients. I don't think too much, you don't expect that much in the, in the small galaxies you have a larger gradient. Well, there's this big puzzle. Why aren't there any H2 regions two or three times solar? I mean, they, you would see only hydrogen lines. They would have no forbidden lines because the cooling would be in the infrared. Uh, Rob Kennecott says he's never seen such a thing, but maybe they just can't get that high. We need to go up to the reactor. Any other question, comment? Julieta. Um, why do planetary nebula migrate? You know, we have this spiral disk with the spiral lamps, and the objects in this, they do migrate. There, is, there, are, there are recent studies that the, the especially all the stars, that do not stay all the time in the same position relative to the galactic center and they change positions, can go. I'm not sure, uh, I'm afraid that the specialists uh, do not agree very well if they, are, if they go inside or outside, they can go inside or outside. And it, I think it is a result of encounters with other with our stars or whatever, so the stars move inside the disk. The fact, flatter, the fact that you have flatter gradients implies that they have moved back and forth, and yeah. the initial Possibly, gradient yes. disappeared. Possibly, yes. <coughs> thanks. Any other question or comment? No, we will. Thanks again. Yeah, yeah. Next speaker is Piet van Hoof, and he will give us a talk on the very fast evolution of the VLTP object. 
this number Sagittarius. Okay. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Thank you. So here you see, oh, sorry, that was not what I wanted. So here you see a list of uh, my collaborators. Um, the ones I want to point out are uh, Stefan Kiemersberger, Griet van Steenen, Adam Everson, they've been very helpful in the data reduction of the X shooter spectra and the OMA spectra that you will be seeing uh, later on. Um, so I'll start with an outline. Um, there's an obvious introduction where we'll talk a bit about the nature of the object. Um, I will mention uh, a few things about evolutionary models of Sakurai's object. And then I will get into the, the data that we have acquired. Uh, there are optical and radio observations. We have bit of red observations of the dust. And we have an almost spectrum of Sakurai's object. And then at the end, I will uh, give you a preliminary discussion of the data. Uh, I would like to stress that the data reduction and especially the interpretation of the data is not yet complete. We've been struggling a great deal with the data reduction, especially of the X shooter spectra, also with the Vizier mid infrared data that I'll be showing you. Uh, the, the pipelines were not doing what they were supposed to do, so that uh, delayed uh, quite a few things. So, um, Sakurai's object, also known as V4334 Sagittarius, is the central star of an old planetary nebula that underwent a very late thermal pulse a few years before its discovery in 1996. So for those who may not be familiar with uh, uh, stellar evolution, when the star is at the AGB, the tip of the AGB, it undergoes uh, a number of uh, semi-regular, uh, semi-periodic uh, thermal pulses where there is a short helium flash. Um, once the object evolves off uh, the AGB, it becomes a planetary nebula, and in a few of these objects, there will be one last thermal pulse after this left the, the AGB. And Sakurai's object is one of those. So it, it's theorized that about 20, well, maybe 20 percent of objects should undergo such a uh, uh, late thermal pulse, but only very few objects uh, have actually been observed, and Sakurai is one of those, so it makes it a very unique object. During this uh, very late thermal pulse, uh, the object ingested the remaining hydrogen-rich envelope into the helium-burning shell, and this then produces very dramatic effects, as you can imagine. Um, so there's very rapid nuclear burning going on as a result of the hydrogen that is mixed in. And this material is then immediately ejected afterwards. So this gives you a unique opportunity to study nuclear burning uh, in the ejector, because they are immediately ejected. They're not mixed with anything in the, in the star. Uh, so you see directly the, the uh, abundance and isotope patterns that are produced in the, in the flash. So this material is now moving away from the central star and is now forming a new hydrogen-deficient nebula inside the old PM. During the flash, the star brightened considerably and became a very cool, born-again HB star, so it's really looking like a carbon star. A few years after that, uh, dust formation started in the ejecta, and this now obscures uh, the central star. We can no longer see it, and this is very similar to our corporeal stars. Uh, emission lines were discovered, first helium-1, 10,830 in 1998 by IRIS, and later also in 2001 optical forbidden lines from neutral and single ionized species of nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And this is published in Kerber. So this is an image of the object. Uh, on the left here, you see an oxygen-free image uh, showing the old PN. This is a nice spherical uh, planetary nebula. Superimposed uh, in the blue contours are radio observations from the, the VLA. So you can see that the old PN has been detected by the VLA, but there's also here a central source. This coincides with the, the, the new ejects that were ejected uh, during the VLTP. And here in the inset, you see a blow up of, of this region here. So you can see this. Uh, this looks like a bipolar uh, nebula here, but this is that will probably be an overinterpretation. So this has been published in Hydrook uh, et al. 2005. So uh, we'll go through a few follow-up observations that were not done by us, but which are relevant for uh, the discussion. Um, Chesno et al. 
observed saccharide objects uh, using the VLTI, and they detected the presence of a thick and dense dust thick disk with a dimensions 30 by 40 milliarc seconds. So this is the model that it was produced to uh, interpret uh, the VLTI data. And so you can see uh, so the disk here, and here you can see into the inner regions of the torus. So this is the brightest part where it, that is directly irradiated by the central star. And this is showing you right. And on the other side, you can't see it because there it's obscured. So the other one that is uh, uh, really relevant for our discussion are uh, adaptive optic images taken in the KS band uh, by Henkel and Joyce, 2014. Um, so they have done this twice. On the left-hand side, you see images taken in 2010, and these ones are taken in 2013. Uh, the central star is here marked by the circle, and you can see there are bipolar lobes here, and here that were detected in both images. You can see that they are expanding and also becoming more diffuse. And what you also can see is the central stars can considerably be brighter here in the 2013 image. So uh, we'll talk a bit about evolutionary models. Uh, Sakurai's object baffled the scientific community with a very fast evolution. And it's what's much faster than pre-discovery models predicted by uh, something like an order of magnitude faster. Uh, since then, theoreticians have been trying to explain this, of course, and uh, three evolutionary models have been proposed to explain the fast evolution. Um, one of them is by Falk Herwig. Um, um, he assumed that hydrogen burning takes place close to the cell surface um, after the ingestion of the envelope Hydrogen then stays close to the surface because uh, mixing it deeper into, the, um, into the, the star is suppressed by convection, which is not used by the hydrogen ingestion flash. Uh, this mechanism he is now investigating further by making f uh, f uh, detailed full 3D hydro models. Um, so Lowell and McDonald was the first to predict a double loop evolution in the hasbro russell diagram. I will show you that later on in the graph. Um, this is the result also of the hydrogen ingestion flash. So the first loop is a result of uh, the HIF at six place very close to the surface and therefore immediately affects the, the, the photosphere of the star. The, the regular helium flash happens deeper inside the star and takes longer to reach uh, the surface. And that then becomes the second loop. Uh, finally, uh, Miller, Bertolami et al. claim that they can reproduce very fast evolution by using very small time steps, but without changing the mixing physics. And this then raises doubts about the accuracy of the other calculations. So, and on the left, you see then the evolution in the hasbro russell diagram. The flash happens around here. The star then very, very quickly becomes an HEB star and is then here at the tip, uh, the coolest, uh, reaches the coolest temperature. It, here this resembles a carbon star and it's still in the vicinity of this point. It is predicted to then fairly quickly, or for stars very quickly, evolve to very hot temperatures, uh, close to 100,000 Kelvin and stay there for a while. And then when the, the, the reheating flash it takes effect, it will move again back to the HB, and then will eventually resume its normal evolution as a planetary nebula. In the inset, you see the three models that have been proposed to reproduce this evolution, the one by Her uh, Herwig, Willer, Bertolami, and Lawler. Uh, shown here are some temperature de determination from the era when the central star was still visible, so they could uh, analyze uh, uh, the photospheric lines. Uh, since then, there are no new points uh, since the star is uh, obscured, and we have no other ways um, at the moment to determine the temperature. So we set up a, a program to try and uh, derive the stellar temperature evolution. Uh, the basic idea is to uh, view uh, the emergence of photoionized lines in the nebula, and from that, then via modeling, determine what the central star temperature is. Uh, so far, we've not been able to get convincing signatures of photoionization in the nebula, 
But nevertheless, uh, we've continued monitoring the evolution and it has given us other interesting uh, clues about what is happening in the object, which I'll tell you about later. Um, so we've been modeling it in, with using uh, VLTI, uh, sorry, VLT, uh, the first instrument, and also we have been uh, doing radio flux observations with the, the VLA. Initially, the optical lines showed an exponential decline in intensity and also a decreasing level of excitation, and this trend continued until 2007. So between 2001 and 2007, the optical spectrum is consistent with a shock that occurred before 2001 and started cooling and recombining afterwards. The low electron temperature derived from the nitrogen two lines in 2001, which is between three and 5,000 Kelvin, and the carbon one lines in 2003, which is between two and a half thousand and 4,000 Kelvin, is consistent with this. Uh, the earliest evidence for the shock is the detection of the helium one line to 10,813 angstrom in 1998. And we know from all our spectrum that this line was absent in 1997, so the shock must have occurred around 1998. And it must have stopped soon after leaving cooling and recombining gas in its wake. So this is then the plot of the evolution of the line strengths in the spectra from 2001 to 2007. Note the logarithmic scale here, so you can see uh, these line strengths are nicely consistent with an exponential decline. <laughs> And also you can see that the oxygen two lines, which are the highest excitation lines, have the steepest decline, while lower excitation lines have a less steep decline. So what happened after 2007? And here you can see there's in two plots, I've added a few lines. Uh, so the carbon one line has been added here and the helium one lines have been added here. Um, we can see that the line fluxes have been monotonically increasing since 2008. So there's a marked break in behavior since 2008. There have been a few minor exceptions, but they're probably all due to low signal to noise and or uh, toluic contamination in the line. So essentially all line fluxes have been going up since 2008 and are continually rising. Note also the discontinuous jump, which is a bit hard to see, but this is oxygen two which is coming down here exponentially. And then there's a big jump going up to 2008 to about here. And then it also shows a gradual increase. This is the only line where we see such a big jump. Other, other lines all show a gradual change in behavior. So this is the optical spectrum from 2013. Uh, both spectrum are the same. It's just here the scale is blown up so that you can see the weak lines. So the, the spectrum is dominated by carbon one lines, forbidden carbon one. There's oxygen two here, there's nitrogen two lines here, and uh, some forbidden oxygen one lines. The weak lines you can see here, there's the nitrogen one 5200 angstrom. There's here the, the temperature 5755 line of nitrogen two. A couple of helium one lines and here, and here are the sulfur two uh, density sensitive lines. So, uh, the helium one lines are reported here for the first time. Uh, they were not visible in the spectrum that we presented in the 2007 paper. Um, the sulfur two lines have been rediscovered. They were uh, de detected already by Kerber, but were lost after that. Uh, but now, thanks to the better signal to noise of the, the force detectors, we can see them again. <coughs> So when we did this uh, series of observations, we noted at some point that the lines were shifting. So we were interested in what was the cause of that, and because the force spectra are low resolution, we couldn't really tell much from those. So we decided in 2015 to take an X-shooter spectrum, which is a medium resolution spectrograph, which gives us plenty of resolution to detect and study uh, the line profiles in this object, and this is the result of that. Um, so what you see here is a position velocity diagram of the nitrogen two 6,583 angstrom line. Uh, you can see here uh, a blue shifted lobe and a red shifted lobe. Uh, above here is the velocity scale. A zero is the systemic velocity of uh, the central star, derived from uh, emission lines from the old planetary nebula. And here you can see uh, the position of the blue shifted emission and the position of the red shifted emission. I should mention that the position angle of the spectrum here is aligned with the bipolar lobes that were seen by Hinkle and Joyce. So you can clearly see that these two uh, lobes are shifted with respect to each other. We measured that up. 
You can also see the continuum, so we know where the star is. And from this, we could then uh, detect, uh, determine that the redshift lobes are uh, 0.24 arc seconds uh, uh, to, to the above, and minus so 0.18 arc seconds to the below for the, the blue shifted emission. And this uh, coincides very nicely with the, the bipolar lobes seen uh, by Henkel and Joyce. So from this, we can deduce that the nitrogen 2 emission comes from these lobes. So this is the same line, uh, nitrogen 2 line, and I've now taken in blue an old observation. This is a uh, force spectrum with R is 1200, and in red, you now see the, the actual spectrum that you just saw in the position velocity diagram. Um, you can see very obviously that the line has become narrower, and also appears to have been shifted somewhat. Uh, the distance here and here is, is clearly different. Uh, again, the systemic velocity is set at zero kilometers per second here. And um, what you can see, there are two things that are worth noting here. You see that the, the peak ratio of the blue shift and the red shift lobe has changed, has become larger. And also, as I already mentioned, that the velocity as a total has become uh, less. And I think the most plausible explanation is that this is due to mass loading of the wind. Uh, there's also been a suggestion by group members that this could be an effect of extinction, that the, the, the red wing is extinct more than the blue wing, but the fact that the, the peak ratio has gone up, I think, argues against that. Another thing that we've been seeing since 2013 is the emergence of a new line complex, which has not been seen before. Um, these are the spectra from 2013, 14, 15, and uh, 2016. And I should note that these spectra have not been shifted or uh, modified in any way. So what you see here is the real flux evolution of uh, this line complex. And you can also see that the continuum flux here is also rising. We tentatively identify that some of these lines are electronic transitions in uh, CN and um, the one to zero lines would be in this complex. The zero zero lines would be the unidentified lines reported by Hinkle and Joyce 2014. We've also been doing uh, observations uh, with Vizier on the VLT. So this is a mid-infrared spectrograph, which allows us to get a dust continuum uh, at 12.9 micron. micron. The original goal of this uh, proposal was to get neon-2 emission. We've not seen that, but we do, of course, get the dust continuum, so we'll report on that. Uh, this graph contains uh, continuum fluxes from a number of sources. The blue asterisks are taken from Spitz IRS spectra. They are by far the most accurate uh, fluxes, and they show a very nice uh, decline of the dust continuum. So the red diamonds are the Vizier observations. Uh, data reductions of these are not completely finalized yet. Um, that's, for instance, the reason why there are no error bars on here. Um, but likely these three points have very large error bars, and that would be the reason why they deviate so much from the trend. Uh, these should be better. Um, these data points are also still uh, work in progress. And there's also here, uh, barely visible uh, diamond uh, point from Wise, which also seems to deviate from the trend uh, seen in Spitzer. It's not clear yet why that is the case. Um, but what is clear from the data that we have is that up till 2011, there is uh, a roughly exponential decline in the 12.8 micron flux consistent with cooling dust. What happened afterwards is not clear. It could be that the flux has just stabilized or it went through minimum and is now rising again. Um, so that we cannot say which one of the two it is. Uh, Hinkle and Joyce claim that the dust flux is, con uh, is increasing at the moment, but I don't know. But, uh... So on to the VLA observations. So we detected radio flux in 2004 and 2005. You've already seen that in, uh, in one of the earlier slides. Uh, in 2006 and 2007, we saw a very marked increase in the radio flux. And at the time, we interpret that as evidence for the onset of photoionization of, of carbon. However, 
later data that we've recently obtained show that the radio flux has returned back to the levels of 2004 and 2005. So uh, photonization seems to be out as an explanation for this. So that leaves only uh, uh, shock as a plausible explanation for the rise in uh, radio flux here. Okay, on to the, the ALMA data. So we recently obtained ALMA spectra ranging from 212 to 246 gigahertz. And we detected several lines in there. There are CO line here. There's a 13 CO line there. Uh, we detected several lines from the, the HC3N ladder. Here's one, there's one, uh, there's one, and there's one. And we also detected isotopologs of that. Uh, so they marked here HC3 and ISO, that is a combination of HC 13 CCN and HCC 13 CN, which have uh, pretty much the same moment of inertia. And we also uh, have uh, maybe detections here of HC 13 CCCN. So these are the moment zero maps of the AMA observations. This is uh, CN. And you can see there's a very nice bipolar structure in there and it aligns uh, very nicely with the bipolar blobs uh, seen by Hinkel and Joyce. Here you have the CO and CO is more or less unresolved and coincides with uh, the central source. Mm, doesn't want to switch. Okay, so next slide. So in the middle here, you see the dust continuum observation. And again, it's consistent with a point source uh, coinciding with the central star. So that means we see no dust emission in the lobes. And here then it finally is the HC3N emission again, uh, 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 consistent with a point source coinciding with the central star. So cloudy modeling. Unfortunately, we have no cloudy models to show. Um, because the data reduction was taking much longer than expected. So we didn't get around to making the models. Also, uh, the current version of Cloudy cannot predict HC3N. So I did some work on uh, updating the chemistry uh, to include uh, the RAID12 uh, chemistry network. This is work in progress. Um, it will probably not, or certainly not be in the C16 release, but most likely it will be in the subsequent major release. So that's something you can look forward to. So I will then go on with a preliminary discussion. It's more of, it's kind of a combination of a, a summary and uh, uh, initial uh, discussion of uh, the results that we had. So V4, 3 V4 Sagittarius underwent a VLTP a few years before its discovery in 1996, detected a new and hydrogen deficient nebula in the process. The geometry of the source was clarified by Chesno, who discovered the presence of a dense and thick dust disk and Hinkle and Joyce discovered the presence of bipolar lobes in the KS band. These appear to be expanding uh, with a size of about 0.4 arc seconds from tip to tip. Emission lines were first discovered in 1998, uh, helium-1 line, and also in 2001, uh, the optical lines. And the optical emission spectrum has been monitored since. And from 2001 to 2007, the optical spectrum showed an exponential decline and that was evidence for a cooling shock that occurred around 1998. A plausible explanation for this shock is that this is the fastest material ejected in the VLTP, hitting older ejector, possibly black filled material from the old PN. Between 2005 and 2007, the 8 gigahertz radio emission showed a marked increase and has returned to pre-2005 levels since. 
you see no counterpart for this behavior in the optical data. Since this most likely is caused by a shock, it must have occurred in an obscured region, which means it must have been very close to the central star, possibly the inner regions of the disk. The optical lines flux started to increase again since 2008. Uh, the sudden jump in the O2 flux could point to a second shock as the cause of the change in behavior. So maybe this is the same shock you see in the radio between 2005 and 2007, now breaking out of the obscured region and becoming visible in, uh, in uh, optical wavelengths. And our working hypothesis is that the wind is now interacting with the lobes and uh, the actuator spectra of the, the nitrogen 2 line nicely confirm this. The optical spectrum also shows that new lines have been emerging since 2013, and some of these have tentatively been identified as electronic transitions of CN. Um, the optical CN lines uh, are formed close to the central star. I did not show this, but it also comes from the actuator spectra, possibly in the disk. If the optical CN lines are pumped by UV radiation from the central star, this is an indication that the reheating of the central star has started. Um, and this would then be uh, another means of getting the central star, uh, evo star temperature evolution as a function of time. The optical spectrum shows a rise in continuum emission since 2013. This could indicate that the extinction of the central star is becoming less or that the starlight is more efficiently scattered. Uh, the flux density of the dust emission at 12.8 microns showed a roughly exponential decline until 2011 consistent with cooling dust. Uh, the evolution since 2011 is un unclear, so we can neither reject or nor confirm the claim from Hinkle and Joyce that the dust is currently heating up. Uh, this is done my light. last slide. Uh, in the spectra, we detect the presence of CO, CN, HC3N, and 13C isotope blocks of these molecules. The carbon monoxide and HC3N plus isotope blocks emission is unresolved, so most likely comes from the disk. It is not clear whether these molecules come from the stellar photosphere and survived the ejection or were formed in situ. Uh, the presence of C2H2 uh, discovered by Evans in I, uh, Spitzer IRS spectra could point to uh, photospheric uh, origin. The continuum is also unresolved, so we see no dust emission in the lobes, and this indicates that all the dust is in the, dust is in the disk. The ALMA CN and 13 CN emission is resolved and matches the bipolar lobes. So maybe CN is formed by shock induced dissociation in the H of HCN in the lobes. And so we could be witnessing here the very early stages of hydrodynamic shaping of a bipolar anemona. And uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pete. Some question, comment? Ah. So, so maybe I missed this, but what is the evidence that the, the central peak is actually a disk? And it's that comes from VLTI. So, oh, okay. um, if I oh yes, you I remember. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we will thanks again, Peter and all the speakers. And we now have a coffee break till quarter past 11. Ah! <laughs> 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 
hace que se acabe este sabor. Esto hace tres años. Sí, es que es Sí, no, pero muchas que van agarraditos de la mano, igual como las regiones H2.
ciega y puedo ser el ser es que vivir no es fácil. ¿Quién me está dando este atributo?
te lo pongo aquí. Ahí está, a ver, habla. A ver, hola, 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 hola. Nada más este. Acá, espera. La che, la che. Acá me lo mueven. Ya, cuando lo ponen abajo, se va a la. ¿Ve? Hasta me escucha a mí. Ok, ok. Vale, nice, nice, nice. Oh. Yes. Sí. Voy a aprovechar. Voy a aprovechar algo así. Vale, pero sí. ¿Hay algo para, para apuntar? Ah, la serie. Ah, ok, perfecto. ¿Eh? Tarda. A veces lo tienes que salir y volver a entrar. Well, welcome back to this second session of this morning. Uh, and the first speaker is Jorge Garcia Rojas. <laughs> que nos va. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jorge, el mismo nombre, <laughs> but uh, but we'll speak in, in, in English uh, about the uh, uh, link between high uh, abundance discrepancy factors uh, in determinability and close uh, binary stars. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for letting me uh, give this talk in, here in this auditorium. This is a, the fifth time I gave a talk here, but this is the, my first one in, in, in English. So I'm going to present uh, my work uh, relating to high uh, ADF planetary nebula and close binary stars. These are my collaborators. The team is very serious people, as you can see. Romano Corradi, uh, which is expert in photodynamics and nebulae, also in binary stars. These two guys are the binary guys at the IAC. Hector Monteiro from Brazil, that helped uh, help us a lot with uh, IFU observations. Henry Bofan and Roger Wesson of uh, ESO. Okay, Roger Wesson is this guy, not the other one. <coughs> okay. I want to also thank Manuel for his introductory talk because, well, he, he explained a lot of things about uh, this problem of the abundance discrepancy. I'm going to focus here on the uh, dependence of line emissivities with electron temperature. It's very important because you have here that uh, optical collisional excited lines of oxygen-3 uh, depend a lot, these are different densities, on the, uh, the emissivity on the electron temperature. And the dependence is very different to the uh, hydrogen recombination lines. Abundances are computed relative to hydrogen in uh, photogenes and nebulae. On the other hand, infrared collision excited lines have a very different uh, dependence with electron temperature. And optical recombination and oxygen have a very similar dependence of uh, uh, with temperature with hydrogen. This makes, uh, well, this the well-known problem of the um, abundance discrepancy is that the abundance obtained uh, compute from optical recombination lines are always higher than those computed for collision accepted lines. This is the picture. Uh, you have the ion, the twice ionized ion, and if you see the optical recombination lines, you, you see one thing, and if you uh, look at the collision accepted lines, you see another thing. But in principle, it's the same nebulae. So uh, the ADF is defined uh, like that. Uh, Manuel explained it. This is a uh, definition by Xiao Wei Liu. 
And there are the proposed mechanisms to explain this abundance discrepancy are mainly three. The temperature fluctuations, Manuel gave a beautiful talk about this. The kappa distribution of thermal electrons. Uh, well, most of uh, several uh, talks in, in this meeting have discarded this. And the chemical uh, presence, the presence of chemical inhomogeneities. Okay. The point is that, well, in photoionic nebulae, we have the planetary nebulae and the H2 regions. Planetary nebulae have abundance uh, discrepancies that can range up to a factor of 120 if you uh, um, compute the, the general, the global light of uh, coming from a planetary nebula. And in some cases, uh, special cases of particular knots in planetary nebulae, you can reach abundance discrepancies of 700. This is huge. In H2 regions, the wooden discrepancies are more or less constant between a factor of uh, one and, and four. So if you try to do a chemical, chemically homogeneous photonization model, uh, it's impossible to reproduce the temperature fluctuations uh, needed to explain this huge uh, abundance discrepancy uh, factors. Even the moderate is difficult, but huge is impossible. So we discard for this large ADF uh, planetary nebula, we discard temperature fluctuations and kappa distribution, and we focus on the chemical inhomogeneities. Um, well, several uh, models have been done uh, trying to explain uh, this a large abundant disturbance factor of planetary nebula. None of them ha has been done using cloudy, sorry, Gary. Uh, the Daniel Peguignot tried with uh, the Nebu code uh, a model of NGC 6153, and uh, Juan and collaborators using Mocassin uh, made a 3D uh, photonization model. Uh, both find the more or less the same issue include two components, one H rich and one H poor. With this, uh, well, the, the H poor component is very low, uh, low mass component, and is uh, very cold, much uh, more denser than the H rich component. And the abundance, the relative abundance to, uh, uh, of metals to hydrogen are very, very high, much higher than the H rich component. This is, uh, so, uh, they could explain with this more or less uh, reasonably well the observed spectra of recombination lines and collisional excited lines. Well, I'm going to focus now on, on the main topic of this talk. Well, you know the planetary nebula have a lot of uh, shapes. Uh, they are not run this uh, as it was uh, in principle uh, thought several years ago. Uh, they have a huge range of forms, elliptical, point symmetric, whole glass. This uh, cannot be explained with a classical uh, explanation of uh, shaping planetary nebula, but you have to invoke magnetic fields, uh, the presence of giant planets, or the presence of a binary central star. These binary central stars have been uh, the, the number of binary, confirmed binary central star in planetary nebulae have been increasing in the last years. Until right now, we have uh, uh, more than 90 uh, binary central stars confirmed in planetary nebula. You, have, you can check the list in the web uh, page of one of my collaborators, Dave Jones. It's drdjones.net. Um, and here we have a uh, beautiful plot made by another of my collaborators, Roger Wesson, in which uh, he plots the, well, all the planetary nebulae in its regions with measure uh, ADF. These regions are the red ones, and the planetary nebulae are the green one. And the blue ones are planetary nebulae with confirmed uh, central, uh, binary central star. You see that they are uh, here in the range of large ADF. These other three planetary nebula are proposed to have a close binary star in the, in the center. 
And this one is the outlier, of course. You have to be to have an outlier. An outlier. This is NGC uh, 5189. Okay, the largest ADF ever measured were in the H poor nodes in Abel 30 and Abel 58. These are two born again planetary nebula. The born again planetary nebula are uh, planetary nebula that have experienced a very late, in principle, as, uh, supposed to be a planetary nebula that have experienced a very late thermal pulse. Uh, Peter Van, Van Hoof explained what is a very late thermal pulse. Well, in principle, you have, after the ejection of the planetary nebula, you have a, a, a helium uh, pulse, thermal pulse, that burns all the hydrogen and eject a new, uh, a new uh, H-pool envelope. So in this planetary nebula, they, uh, Roger found uh, ADF of 700 in Abel 30 and 90 in Abel 58. In 2006, Shao Liu studied this uh, other planetary nebula, HF22, and found in the interweighted spectra of the planetary nebula, the planetary nebula, uh, they uh, found the largest ADF ever measured for an interweighted spectra of a planetary nebula. It was about uh, 70. Well, the point is that the central star of this planetary nebula uh, was a, a binary star, a close binary star. In principle, this uh, close binary star uh, have, they, it was thought that uh, uh, the nebula maybe was formed in a common envelope event because the uh, ionizing mass they measured was much lower than the typical mass of a planetary nebula ejection. And what is a common envelope event? Well, this is mainly for, for students. I'm not the expert on, on that, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> this is a short-lived phase. The primary star, this one, the bulbs and growth size filling this lobe uh, roach. There is a lobe roach overflow and a start uh, the, then starts the mass transfer from the primary to the secondary. The secondary cannot account for such large mass transfer, and all the material fills also the roach lobe of the secondary, so it creates a common envelope. So both stars are in a, in a common envelope. Um, owing to the drag forces, both objects lose, uh, lose energy and uh, become the, orbit, the orbit becomes closer, and due to the loss of orbital energy, there is a, a, the envelope heat up and expand, and expand. So eventually, this envelope is expelled into space. Well, following this, uh, Romano Corradi was studying, uh, trying to find uh, a central star in planetary nebula, and with a 10-meter 10 10 meter telescope, the GTC, and a 10-minute uh, spectra, he, uh, he was looking the, the, well, he was studying the central star. He, he found that there, there was also a binary central star. And they took a spectra to, to, to study the chemistry of the nebula, and they found this, these two features, very strong features, almost typical uh, the strength similar to the aurora line of oxygen. And he contacted me and told me, what is this? And I told him, oh, I know what is that. The recombination lines, this is a carbon recombination line. This is a blend of several recombination oxygen two lines and other things. We need to, to, to take a uh, spectra with a better res spectral resolution. And we did it. We uh, select three. Uh, the, this uh, planetary nebula was 05. It was of the IFAS catalog. And we took another two with known uh, post common envelope then binary central stars. And we took a spectrum with the William Herschel telescope, a 4.2 uh, meter telescope. And we found, oh, very, very, very bright carbon two and oxygen two recombination lines. And 
we made all the, all the chemical analysis and we found ADF of 120 on Abel uh, 46 and 56 on O5. Also, uh, Abel 36, the ADF was not uh, so large, but it was larger than the typical ADF in planetary nebula. So, we also measure in uh, Abel 46 and O5 uh, the temperature from considering uh, optical recombination lines diagnostics, and we found that the uh, temperature we using these the diagnostics was colder than using the typical collisional excited light diagnostics. So, in principle, it seems that the recombination lines come from a colder gas. We also study the um, profile of the mission, and we found that uh, the recombination lines, the profile of the mission along the slit in Abel 46 of the recombination lines was very different to the profile of the mission of the uh, collisional excited line, the nebular collisional excited lines, but very similar to the auroral collisional excited line. We could not explain this. Uh, we also, well, we uh, extract the spectrum in the central seven uh, arc seconds, and we also, uh, also see that um, the ADF in the central part was huge. We compute an estimation of the masses of the, of the uh, ionized gas, and we also found that the masses was, uh, were quite lower, much lower than the typical masses of uh, uh, ionized gas in the planetary nebula. We also uh, did uh, this analysis for another planetary nebula, NGC 6778, which is a planetary nebula with a known binary closed central star with uh, force data. We found the same, more the same, uh, the, um, which is this one. The profile of the recombination lines is very similar to the ne uh, auroral collision excited line, but different of the nebular uh, collision excited line. And the ADF peaks in the central parts of the nebula. This is, uh, well, the last study we have done. This is a study of a, a master thesis student in N142, which is a planetary nebula with large ADF. Right now, we don't know anything about the central star of this planetary nebula, but with this ADF and the uh, morphology of the planetary nebula, we are right now taking a spectra of the central star to see if it's a possible candidate of a close binary central star. Well, and what we see, what we did to check this, well, we see that the central, uh, the emission of the uh, recombination lines peaks in all the planetary nebula where we measure, peaks in the central part. So we decided to take the first image, direct image of the emission, the recombination line emission in a planetary nebula using the tunable filter in, uh, with the instrument Osiris at the Gran Telescopio Canarias. This is the tunable filter width. We pick in this line, which harbors two in this resolution, well, two oxy and two pure recombination lines. And we made the, the image and compare with the image in two in uh, collision excited lines. And it's not the same. The, 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 the is concentrated, the recombination line emission is concentrated in the central part. This is a combined, uh, with Photoshop, a combined image. And it seems that the recombination line emission comes from a different spatial uh, zone than the uh, collision satellite line emission. We also uh, analyze um, BMOS data from the BLT. Well, the BMOS data, the reconstruction of the BMOS data is quite difficult. So, uh, well, we don't, we are not sure if this is true, but it seems that the recombination line maps in this planetary nebula, this is the oxygen 2, this is carbon 2, well, both very similar. This is the nebular oxygen 3 line. It, 
<laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> and this is the auroral uh, collision excited line of oxygen. It's similar to this. It's not exactly the same, but it's more similar than this. But the point is that this, if you, this, this quotient uh, points to a, a gradient of temperature, but to a gradient of temperature being the temperature in the central part larger than the, in the outer part, which is in principle a, a, the contrary to what we expect because if the recombination lines come from the central part, the gas in the central part should be colder. So this is an issue we, we, uh, we are still uh, discussing. So, well, the possible origins of this h poor component are compiled in uh, Corradi Garcia Rojas et al. Uh, the very late thermal pulse scenario is one of them. It, it, this scenario does not need uh, a, a binary central star, but needs that the uh, ejecta the, the gas, the abundance in the gas, uh, need to be uh, carbon rich. You have to be a very high carbon rich um, gas. The other one is uh, the presence of the, the solid body sublimation in the AGB phase. This is a nice paper by Wilhenny and Gracina Stasinska. Uh, well, it, in principle, it doesn't need also uh, a binary central star, but needs a large comet population in the, in the, in the, um, in the system. Uh, but the, the other two needs a binary central star. This is a nova like a burst needs a binary system, it's okay, but well, several are the other things needed to, uh, no, for, for being a nova like a burst in the observation we have are not, uh, are not uh, we do not fund uh, these uh, things. For instance, in Abel 58, the time scale of the rising binders was several weeks, uh, uh, and in a nova like a burst, it's, it's a question of day. And the final, well, there is a proposal of Lau, De Marco, and Liu that maybe the combination of both the scenarios, BLTP and Nova Like, is possible for the, uh, to explain the Abel uh, 58 knots abundances. And the last one is highly speculative, uh, is the presence of a, um, the destruction of a certain binary Jupiter like planet. This is a, well, a scenario proposed by Bayer and Soccer. It's, well, they say that the, the orbit this side is rooted. Uh, there is a collision of the planet with a post ajb star that produces a new common envelope ejection episode, and the planet ejects first the h rich envelope and then the h poop core. I'm not sure about that because, because it was a paper about other things, and in one point they made this uh, speculation. Uh, well, the point is that that's not all. We have uh, two additional spectra of planetary nebula with known uh, post-common envelope central binary stars. And we have found, this is a paper uh, led by Deb Jones and Roger Wesson, which is in preparation with force to data. We found these are three, uh, six uh, uh, objects, and the six have huge ADS. So, Definitely, is, there is a clear link between large ADF and uh, central binary, uh, close binary stars. Well, uh, in this meeting, there are going to be related words to this. One was uh, posted by a student of Miriam uh, on, on expansion velocities. Um, please. Uh, to, um, be tuned to the next talk by Mike Richard because he's going to say several very interesting things, extending a little bit what I, I, I told here. And the uh, future work, well, we have beautiful Muse data of uh, five objects. This is, well, this, these are pictures taken with my camera uh, when I was observing because I was very excited. These are, well, it, it seems that it's fine, but the, we have several exposure. This is one exposure. We have several exposure to combine to make the signal to noise uh, larger. These are the recombination lines, so we are going to map 
these uh, recombination lines in each spatula of. So we are going to make beautiful images in recombination line emission within these five objects, which are objects with large ADF. We are. Um, we also have time to observe uh, uh, with the Os Osiris blue tunable filter to do uh, direct imaging of the recombination line emission. We, are, we plan to, of course, to use Megara, which is an IFU, uh, which is coming at the, by the end of the year to the GTC, to do uh, maps of the spatial distribution, but also thanks to the large spectral resolution, uh, to do some gas kinematics on, on these uh, central parts of planetary nebula. And of course, well, Harmony is going to be the, the IFU of the future EELT in the, with using the BM plus R disperser. We can cover this, this uh, range, well, well range with a moderate resolution, but we, we can go to very faint objects to map the uh, spatial uh, distribution. So this, uh, this is my summary and uh, uh, conclusions for the work. So we predict that many of the planetary nebula with large ADFs are post-common envelope binaries. The contrary is not necessarily true. There are planetary nebula with central post-common envelope um, binaries that do not have large ADF. NGC 5189 has a low ADF. And the neck legs uh, nebula, we don't found any recombination line in the spectra of the nebula, so we cannot measure the ADF. There are several candidates to search for binarity. In principle, all the planetary nebula with uh, large ADF. We are collecting data. Uh, we are checking deep spectra of all the planetary nebula with confirmed post-common envelope binaries uh, to compute the ADF. And we are going to image several of these planetary nebula with two nebula filters. Right now we have three proposals accepted in GTC. They are in, in the queue of the telescope to observe this uh, recombination line emission in high ADF planetary nebula. What happened? Ah. So, thanks, Gary, for... Uh, thanks a lot, Jorge, for these impressive results. Will? Uh, okay. So, empirically, you clearly have established the relation between binarity and the ADF phenomenon, but what's the physical cause of this as someone that doesn't know? I mean, what's going on? We don't know. Don't know. Don't okay. know anything. I know, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, presenting this research, uh, did uh, people expecting was common envelope, uh, uh, binary central stars, because even our experts in binary stars don't know, that they are not sure with what can be the reading of this. Well, thanks. Maybe, Will. Okay, um, those are beautiful results. Okay. Um, I have a couple of comments. One, um, qualitatively, the difference in the spatial distribution you find between the recombination, optical recombination lines and the collisional lines is in the same sense as you also see in the more moderate ADF uh, uh, nebulae, such as the ring nebula, in the, the sense that the, the, mm -hmm. the, the ORLs are inside. Mm -hmm. And also, and it's given that the... It's the, larger. Yeah, obviously. Yes, obviously the, yeah, uh, the, yeah. Uh, the effect is much larger in your yeah. cases. And also the fact that the 4363 also peaks inside, implying higher temperatures inside than outside. Applying Occam's razor, that makes you think, well, is it possible that the, the recombination lines have a high temperature dielectronic recombination component that, no, I mean, is, is, the question is more for the atomic physicists. Is, it, is that at all possible? We could have missed that? Maybe, of course. <laughs> Why would that be associated with the well, It wouldn't, but, it would, the gen, but as I said, the general point is that even in the, the non-binary cases, Radiation you see the issues. Same thing. Radiation issues, uh, as uh, Chris Davidson said, with the dust, this nitrogen two lines that appear, uh, radiation from the secondary, because these binaries are so close that they are, uh, the secondary is ir irradiated by the primary. So there are very hot scenes there. 
No, maybe. No, I don't know. You, you mentioned in, past, in passing that the mass is very small for this uh, carbon mass, and yes. oxygen rich. I think it's very important to try to figure out what's the total mass that they are injecting to the galaxy to see if these sources are important for chemical evolution models of the galaxy. It seems that the mass is very small, mm -hmm. but uh, it's important to, to, to see what's the yield for the this is the, ma the mass the of hydrogen, ionized hydrogen. Yeah, I know, I know. So, as I'm sitting in more or less the right place and Chris is no longer with us, I was just struck by how many similar themes seem to be coming up in your talk and Chris Davidson's talk about Eta Carini. Is there anything that you might be able to get from a comparison of the systems? Sorry. And then there were a lot of similarities in things that you were talking about uh -huh. with, between Eta Carini and, uh, and, and, and these systems. Uh -huh. Is there any chance that there's some relation? Well, also, Eta Carina is a massive system. Uh, these are, in principle, low to intermediate mass stars, but that they are binary. <laughs> they're binary, and there's these things, but, well, there's uh, abundance anomalies in the, that Chris was talking about as well, which seem to seem yeah. like have, have some kind of... Maybe, maybe. Might maybe. Be something there. Yeah, yeah, well, the, the, in, the, in the talk by Chris, I, I, I thought when, I, when he showed this nitrogen in two lines appearing there, the, so, well, this could be nice, uh, could be an explanation, but why related? I'm not sure. We, we have to, a lot of things to learn here. Thanks a lot. Another comment or question? No? Well, thanks a lot. Oh. <laughs>I'd also like to thank Manuel and Jorge for basically covering pretty much all of my introduction. Um, so we can get on to other things. There were three papers, though, in the poster sessions. I know they're not up there anymore, but I hope you had a chance to look at some of them um, because they are all relevant for this topic. Okay. Um, well, I think the only thing that hasn't been said by Manuel and Jorge is that emission lines are used to measure heavy element abundances throughout the universe, but I think most of us already knew that. Um, this has been covered, that has been covered, that has been covered, <laughs> this has been covered, except I'll just add a few more options to the list of um, possible explanations to the ADF, including one we heard about a couple of days ago. Um, so. Um, most of this work has been done with low-resolution spectroscopy. Um, now, what I'm proposing to do is use high-resolution spectroscopy because inherent to the abundance calculations is the assumption that the permitted and collisionally excited lines come from the same volume or the same plasma. Um, and this can be tested with kinematics, but that requires high-resolution spectroscopy. So basically what we're going to look at is, are the kinematics of the permitted and collisionally excited lines the same? If they're not, we may be able to identify distinct plasma components for the two mechanisms. Um, so there's been a lot of talk on a number of things, but not on the internal kinematics of planetary nebulae, so I'll go over that quickly. Um, the internal kinematics, well, no. basically the first order, a planetary nebula is a shell of swept up gas, which is the interaction between two winds. And the first wind is emitted by the precursor star when it's in its AGB phase. This is a slow, dense wind. 
And during the planetary nebula phase, the central star emits a much more tenuous, faster wind. So basically, this sweeps up a shell of gas out here, and that's what we see as a planetary nebula. Now, if you take a high resolution spectrum, say put a slit across this image, um, you get a spectrum that looks like this. This is what we call a position velocity diagram because one axis corresponds to the position along the slit and the other corresponds to the wavelength or the velocity of the gas that's emitting at each position along the slit. So this way we can see that the front side of the object is blue shifted and coming towards us and the back is red shifted and going away. This is what is known as a velocity ellipse. Now, if you do make these velocity ellipses for a variety of ions, what you find in general is that there's a correlation between the expansion velocity or the splitting between the front and back face of the nebula um, and the excitation that's required to produce the ion that's emitting. Um, Basically, the low ionization ions are expanding faster than the higher ionization ions. And this is basically because the planetary nebula is a plasma and it can't overrun itself, basically. Um, now, the other thing you typically find in planetary nebulae is if you plot the central stars in an HR diagram, you find that as the central star heats up, the, velo the expansion velocity or the line width um, increases as well. So, Let's get on to our first experiment, which was to study the kinematics throughout NGC 7009. This is one of the objects that Jorge showed us. NGC 7009 is an interesting object because it's got an ADF, it's about five, for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon. Um, these were data taken from the um, ESO archive. And basically what it was was a long slit. Well, it wasn't a long slit because the UVIS spectrograph has a short slit, but it was two short slits, one next to the other. And we, if you plot the velocity splitting as a function of ionization potential for the uh, ions that you measure, you get this nice result that looks a lot like what we've seen before. However, if you look at this in more detail, um, you see that the lowest ionization zone that where you can define a velocity splitting is using oxy collisionally excited li lines of ionized oxygen and nitrogen, and they indeed are, have the highest expansion velocities. Next come what's the main mass of the nebula, which are the recombination lines of hydrogen and helium and collisionally excited lines of doubly ionized oxygen and neon. They're next in velocity. The, high, the smallest velocity splitting is for the highest ionization lines, which are all recombination lines of either helium, doubly ionized helium or triply ionized oxygen and nitrogen. They're the innermost, most highly ionized zone. What's interesting is this intermediate range here, um, where we find a bunch of species that are found in the zone where helium transitions from doubly ionized to singly ionized. Um, we have lines that are due to the charge exchange in triply ionized oxygen, Bowen fluorescence in doubly ionized oxygen, and collisionally excited um, triply ionized argon. But we also find recombination lines from these ions, doubly ionized carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon. And what's curious here is that at least doubly ionized oxygen and neon are also up here. Um, these really should coincide, and they don't. And it's actually even a little more puzzling than that, but for that, I need a cloudy model. Um, so I present here a simple, generic, cloudy model. Um, I say inspired by NGC 7009 because it's not in any way customized to NGC 7009. These are the parameters. Um, and what I plot is the log of the ionization fraction as a function of the distance into the nebula. So at, in the center, we have a zone where helium is doubly ionized and oxygen, neon, carbon, and nitrogen are triply ionized. Um, then the main mass of the nebula is this part here where helium is singly ionized and carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon are doubly ionized. And then at the edge, we get a zone where carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon are singly ionized, well, 
helium is still singly ionized here as well. And that, what I haven't shown is the transition zone to the PDR because it's not relevant for this discussion. And there's already enough lines on this plot. Um, now, what's important here to notice is that when we have this central doubly ionized helium zone, it's accompanied by a very extensive zone where carbon and nitrogen are triply ionized. And this is important because where the permitted lines, of, where these permitted lines arise is where the ionization balance is between these doubly ionized ions and singly ionized ions of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon. And that covers very different volumes in the nebula. Um, the O2 and N2 neon 2 lines come from this zone here, whereas the carbon 2 and nitrogen 2 lines come from this zone out here. Um, so apart from the problem that we found observationally that the, all of these N2, C2, N2, O2, and neon 2 lines all arose where we didn't expect them, we should also find a difference in the kinematics between the carbon 2 and nitrogen 2 lines on the one hand and oxygen 2 and neon 2 on the other, but we don't. So there's really two problems with the kinematics. Um, well, we can fix the kinematics if we like. Um, NGC 7009 is optically thin, so we can just lop off some outer part of the nebula and make it optically thin, and then, well, the zones where um, all of these lines arise has to agree and would agree with our observations. On the other hand, if we do that, um, we're also cutting off the volume where most of the carbon-2 and nitrogen-2 emission is expected to arise. And if we did that, we'd expect to find different abundance discrepancy factors for carbon and nitrogen compared to neon and oxygen, and we don't. Um, so we're at something of an impasse here where a single ionization structure cannot simultaneously explain the kinematics of the carbon-2, nitrogen-2, oxygen-2, and neon-2 lines being different from what we see in the collisionally excited lines of doubly ionized oxygen and neon. They can't explain the similar kinematics for carbon-2, nitrogen-2, oxygen-2, and neon-2 permitted lines. Um, and they can't explain, well, simultaneously, the same ADFs that we see for these four species. Um, now, fortunately, in this case, in 7009, from the position velocity diagrams, I don't go into that because I have another thing to talk about, and Christoph will be getting on my case shortly. Um, but basically, um, we can identify two emission components in, well, I, I make the case here for the oxygen-2 recombination lines, but it could also, I could also make exactly the same argument for the neon-2 um, recombination lines. One arises throughout the zone where oxygen is doubly, doubly ionized. I mean, that we expect, and had, it had better happen, or ionization equilibrium doesn't work. Um, but the other arises in the innermost part of the zone where oxygen is doubly ionized. Um, so in NGC 7009, there's this emission component, a second emission component in the oxygen-2 and neon-2 lines that arises from a volume that's different from the volume that emits the collisionally excited lines from the same parent ions. Um, we assume this happens for, the, for carbon and nitrogen as well, but since we don't observe collisionally excited lines from doubly ionized carbon and nitrogen, we can't state that. So basically, that immediately poses a very obvious question, which is whether these multiple plasma components could be common in planetary nebula. So what we've done to address that is um, look at another sample of objects. For about the past 15 years, Beto Lopez and I and Ensenada have been accumulating what we call the San Pedro Martir Catalog of Planetary Nebulae, which provides kinematics for over 600 galactic planetary nebulae and over 200 extragalactic planetary nebulae. And we detect the carbon-2-6578 line in 76 of these objects along 83 lines of sight. There are seven objects for which we have a couple of lines of sight. Um, 
the spectral resolution is basically equal to the spectra I was just talking about. And what we propose to do here is compare the kinematics of the carbon-2 line with H-alpha helium-2 when it's present and nitrogen, the nitrogen-2 collisionally excited lines. Now, obviously, for this, we don't have the same detail we had for NGC 7009, but we do have a decent sample where we can start thinking about whether multiple plasma components are common. Now, I might as well get this out in the open right away. Um, the experts in the room know that this carbon-2 line can be excited by both recombination and fluorescence. Now, in, what, in the arguments I'm going to make and what follows, I'm only going to assume that it arises from recombination because those are the hardest conditions for my arguments to sort of satisfy. Um, the results would be even more convincing if carbon-2 arose from fluorescence. So the basic result is this, um, where I plot, I have three plots here where I plot the line width of the carbon-2 line as a function of the line width of H-alpha, helium-2, and nitrogen-2. The black line is not a fit, it's just a line of unity, so basically equal line widths. The red, the two red lines are the dispersion that we measure um, as being our instrumental and astrophysical uncertainty. Um, so what you see from this is that the carbon-2 line width is normally um, narrower than H-alpha. It's almost always narrower than N2. Um, and it's usually narrower than helium-2. Um, the filled circles and the open diamonds represent objects where um, helium-2 is present or absent. Um, that's why there are only black dots in one figure. Um, now, basically, if you separate the objects according to whether the helium-2 line is present and absent, and you make a cumulative distribution for each line, you see that there are basically, there's a difference between when helium is absent and when helium is present um, for all three lines. And this is basically just telling us that the nebular shells are accelerated um, as time goes on, because basically the, line, the objects with the helium-2 line contain the more evolved central stars. This isn't a new result. I apologize that I'm only going to use cumulative distributions here. I know we all like histograms better. Um, but you can't do statistical tests with histograms. Um, so, or at least it's easier to do them with cumulative distributions. So anyhow, to account for this evolution, what we do is we measure a relative line width. We measure the line width and subtract the line width in H alpha. Um, and we are assuming that this takes care of the evolutionary issues. So what we have now is the relative line widths of these lines, helium, carbon, and nitrogen, from our study. I'll talk about oxygen-3 at the end. And basically, we have the cumulative fraction. So basically, this is the distribution. Um, and what we see is that the helium, which is in purple, is the narrowest. Nitrogen-2, which is in green, is the widest. And carbon-2, well, we would have expected it to be somewhere in between, but it's kind of like helium-2. What's important to note here is that when, um, if you compare, say, the carbon um, cumulative distribution when helium is absent and when it's present, um, you see no statistical difference. I mean, you can apply statistical tests to this, and there's no difference. Um, the same is true of, of nitrogen. The oxygen is shown for comparison. It's from another study. Um, but the oxygen line width distribution um, is very, very similar to that for H-alpha. So um, that's what more or less hydrogen is doing. Um, so we briefly return to our cloudy diagrams. Here are two models that are exact, the same parameters as before, except I've changed the central stars to two black bodies. And basically what you see is when you go from cool stars to hotter stars, you get this helium-2 emission zone, or doubly ionized helium zone, that doesn't really affect where the oxygen or nitrogen comes from very much, but it does have a very important effect on where the carbon-2 emission comes from. Um, when helium-2 is present, the carbon-2 emission zone is pushed to the edge of the nebula. 
And we should, I mean, that will make a big difference in the line widths because, I mean, the, here is where you get small line widths. This is where you get large line widths. Um, and so basically, if carbon-2 gets shoved out here, we expect the line width distributions to change. So we can ask ourselves, do observations match theory? Well, the helium-2 line should have the smallest line width, and it does. Um, nitrogen-2 should be largest, and it is. Um, Oxygen-3 should have a line width similar to, to H-alpha, and it does. You see that most of the, most of the action happens near zero. Um, and the line widths of oxygen-3 and nitrogen-2 shouldn't depend on whether helium-2 is present or absent, and it doesn't. Um, so all of this agrees with theory. Um, now, the carbon-2 lines are where things get complicated. Carbon-2 should have a line width distribution um, that's similar to oxygen-3 and H-alpha when helium-2 is absent. So we have helium-2 absent here, so these two should be similar, and they're not. They're statistically different. Um, and when I say statistically different, there's less than a 2% probability that they arise at random from the same parent population. Um, and when helium-2 is present, the line width distribution for carbon-2 should be similar to that for nitrogen-2, and it's not. Um, so carbon-2 is consistently um, anomalous in the sense that it, uh, it basically the line width distribution the line widths are smaller than you would expect. That implies that it comes, it's at least mimicking gas or plasma that's more internal in the nebula than you would expect for carbon, for doubly ionized carbon ions. Um, so basically, well, I just said that. Um, so the kinematics of the carbon tune line are not those expected if it arises in a, chemi in a chemically homogeneous nebular plasma. And basically, this is. Given the example of 7009, which is also in the second sample, um, implies that multiple plasma components could be common in planetary nebulae. Um, now, we can look at this another way and say, well, what of the, which of the solutions that have been proposed for the ADF could, could be compatible with our observations? Um, well, this idea of metal-rich clumps is compatible. Unfortunately, it's unknown how they arise, which might sound very convenient for explaining things, but from a physical point of view, it's almost always unhelpful. Um, then physical processes that affect recombination throughout the normal nebular plasma in the zone where carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon are doubly ionized, these should not generate the kinematics we observe. Um, on the other hand, the kinematics we observe don't exclude that these things also happen. And I mean, undoubtedly, some part of this does happen. Um, so there's obviously still a lot of work to do. Um, now, pre a few previous studies have found similar results. Mike Barlow published some results in an IAU symposium back in 2006 that showed show similar results. Otsuka. Um, showed that this also happens in one object, at least for the oxygen two lines. Um, there are, and basically Jorge um, and Will with his comment mentioned that the studies of spatial distributions of permitted lines, I mean, there are observations going back to the 1980s that show that permitted lines are more centrally concentrated than collisionally excited lines in the same parent ions. Our results are entirely compatible with that. On the other hand, if there are multiple plasma components, this abundance discrepancy problem could take on another sort of facet. Um, until now, the debate has been on which abundance is correct, um, or largely it's been about that. And it's possible that both are correct. I mean, if there are two plasma components, maybe both are correct. Um, why they would have different chemical compositions presumably depends upon their origin. Um, so my overall conclusions are that the kinematics of permitted lines imply that these multiple plasma components could be common in planetary nebulae. This might explain the abundance discrepancies in planetary nebulae in the sense that if the different plasma components have different compositions, this doesn't really help us much in explaining things because we, really we've only moved the problem to another 
sort of another position, shall we say, or another, we just pushed the problem a little along. Um, um, it's crucial to understand the origin of these multiple components in order to interpret the chemical compositions. Um, they're usually, in, bo both components or, or all these components are normally assumed to have the same origin, and that's not always going to be the case. Um, and, well, as I say, this could have implications for chemical abundances throughout the universe, but, I mean, we don't, we do have to do, a, we have a lot more work to do. Um, and, I mean, some of these studies are already in progress. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, Will? I'm sorry to ask a question again. But, uh, so that was another beautiful talk. And uh, I just have a question about the fluorescence. You said that the flu if you include the fluorescence, then the problem is worse. But in, I'm not sure about this line in particular, but many lines, you only need a trace amount of C++ in order to get the fluorescence. So if there, there could be a fluorescent component, and it could come from, from a very interior zone. Maybe Christoph could, or Vladimir could comment. Christoph, do you want to comment first? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> We have we have to see where where where, where these components should come from, yeah. but. Sorry, that for some fluorescent lines, even from the double plus ion, they really come from the triple plus region because amount of there. Yeah, I mean, the reason for that is the UV lines that are driving the pumping, once they get to optical depth unity, they don't pump anymore. Yeah. It's only in the linear part of the curve of growth that they're effective pumping. So it's just that they, they become self-quenching. If I could change the subject, uh, if you've, uh, it was a big mystery when we were doing Don's book. If you describe the velocity field of all PN, I made the mistake of calling it a Hubble flow, but it looks like V proportional to R. Uh, Osterbach, uh, refused to use the word Hubble flow because he, he and Hubble had some issues. But uh, it looks like it's a V proportional R flow. And if I, and then so I went off and I read every paper on the formation of planetary nebular shells to see how you can get a V proportional to R velocity field. And not a single paper, including the, the big annual review article of 15 years ago, mentions the velocity field. Back in the 1950s, they were invoking some kind of explosive release of of recombination energy in the in the red giant to, to get the thing to blow up. And that, that it looked like they were closer to the game in the 1950s than the current hydrodynamical model. So you have any idea whether the dynamicists can get a V proportional to our law out of what they're doing? Well, yeah, Will, Will can answer that. <laughs> Basically, it does tend to increase, but it's not necessarily. I, 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 I think you're, you're right in the sense that the <laughs> Um, the older planetary nebulae certainly have only the Hubble flow, right? But the younger planetary nebulae with the double rim structure, the inner rim is often higher velocity than the, than the outer material. Um, and I think the, the models of Kimiswanger et al. Do, do reproduce that. Um, but maybe that's for later discussion. Okay. Um, ba basically, what, getting back to Will's question about fluorescence, what pumps the, this carbon-2 line is emission from radiation from helium, ionized helium. So it would come from this, this zone. I mean, that could conceivably help bring in the carbon-2 emission here. Um, but then, I mean, you would still expect a strong recombination component at some point, um, which I mean, basically, what drives the line width primarily is where this, where the zone stops, um, because that's the highest velocity. Um, so you would you would still expect to get this recombination emission um, to define largely your the the sort of line width. Um, so basic basically, that I mean, if you don't get fluorescence from in here, it comes from out here, which makes the problem worse, um, right? Because if it doesn't come from... The question is, where does the fluorescence come from? Yeah, right. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's an that's an uncertainty. Okay. Don't your last question. Um, so I, I just have to disagree one with one of your very latest statements that you said that if there are two different kinds of plasmas, then both determinations could be right. I think that in that case, both determinations would be wrong. Probably. Because you, one is used to assuming that, well, we are looking at the carbon plus plus or whatever. We're actually looking or stating that the carbon plus plus to H plus ratio is so much. And the H plus will come from both components. So, so you cannot separate one component from the other. And until you can do that, then both determinations are wrong. I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But you have to know where they come from. Um. <laughs> okay, another comment, question? Thank you. You have, Michael, you have made this beautiful work with planetaries and finding these multiple components in the plasma. What do you think about H2 regions? They have an ADF, not that extreme in some cases, but there is an ADF is also there. Yeah, well, I, I've never looked for this in the spectrum, in the spectrum of an H2 region. I don't know. It, but it's a work I, that should be done. I think. Yes, but the problem is, well, in H2 regions, I'm not very optimistic about kinematics, um, or I'm not so optimistic about kinematics. Um, in planetary nebulae, this works reasonably well in the because planetary nebulae have a certain amount of symmetry. Um, and in H2 regions, you very frequently have geometries that are very asymmetric. Um, so I suspect there's much more, it would be much more profitable to look for this in spatial distributions rather than kinematics. Um, but as I say, I've never really looked for it in, in planetary, in H2 regions. Well, thanks again. Okay. Our next and last speaker for this morning session is Masaki Otsuka that will uh, give us a talk on the test definition model of some galactic planetary nebulae. Nice to meet you. I'm Masaki Oska from uh, Academia Shinika in Taiwan. I would like to introduce uh, my recent uh, results on a dusty planetary nebula. Okay. <laughs> uh, this work is a collaboration with uh, Herschel uh, Harplans, a Herschel planetary nebula surveys. So this work uh, using Herschel data, I try to uh, uh, construct a self consistent model to explain a central star and nebula and the PDR in uh, NGC 6781. Uh, from the observed uh, quantities, such as uh, a UV uh, to radio wavelengths, band flux, and uh, observed uh, all emission line flux and uh, elemental abundances and the H2 condition as an indicator of PDR and the distance, then I, uh, we aim to obtain the evolutionary status of the central star and the mass of the no, mass of progenitor and uh, the condition of the atomic gas and the molecule gas and thus. And finally, I uh, to like to uh, 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 compare the dust mass estimate with uh, without fire IR data to know how much dust mass is from the fire IR component because uh, we used the fire uh, partial data. So 
Uh, this is our use data set of this study. The photometry is from the U in, in Galaxy in UV, optical, ESO, and IR is the UCAT, JHK, and the mid IR is the WISE, uh, Spitzer, ISO. And the far, far IR is uh, our own uh, Hashi data and radio. Uh, in uh, in the, this photometry, uh, we measure the uh, you know, 23 uh, photometry band in total. While uh, spectra, the ho and photometry, we, uh, we can't find out the UV spectra, so we, <coughs> we can't uh, estimate the uh, carbon, uh, uh, carbon abundances using the uh, collisional excitation rise. So in this talk, uh, we we don't uh, uh, discuss the ADF. So, and uh, <laughs> in optical, the uh, we obtain the uh, William Hasted telescope uh, optical spe uh, spectra, and IR and non data, and uh, mid IR is Pizza and Hasted. Uh, this is a Hasted spectra, uh, gray uh, line. These uh, from. Uh, rim positions here, and the chic line is uh, uh, central positions. I found, uh, I indicate the location, uh, position of uh, OH plus and the C of uh, molecule line here. Uh, this is the archival uh, spit, uh, uh, spectra, uh, which is a uh, uh, atomic line, narrow atomic lines, and also pH futures and the prominent H2 uh, pure rotation lines here, and also uh, uh, according to the dust emissivity uh, analysis uh, using Herschel Fire data. Uh, this uh, the future less uh, dust continuum it would be from a uh, amorphous carbon uh, continuum. So uh, that is uh, this uh, planetary nebula is carbon rich, uh, carbon rich dust planetary nebula. Uh, this is a summary of this planetary. As as a uh, remarks, uh, distance is not determined. So distance is very important factor to estimate uh, dust mass and gas mass and uh, molecule gas mass, yes. So we try to uh, uh, determine the distance by our, our uh, techniques. And this object is a very old, uh, 10,000 years after AGB phase. And interestingly, uh, this planetary nebula is very uh, similar to a ring nebula in, term of the, in terms of the chemical abundances. This is a chemical abundances, helium, carbon, neon, oxygen, neon, oxygen, neon, sulfur, chlorine, argon. And also the property of central star is also the very similar effective temperature and surface gravity. So assuming that the both of uh, uh, ring nebula and this uh, our target object uh, share with their evolutional uh, history, uh, I try to uh, set the distance and the un, uh, unobserved uh, iron abundances. Uh, this is an excitation diagram. I created uh, the excitation diagram here. The data is a blue dot, is our uh, the, uh, Spitzer data. The magenta is uh, NIR data measured from Hilliard uh, 2005, this, this one. The <coughs> all data point can be uh, fit with a single temperature model with a temperature 
is uh, 1050 Kelvin, and also all populations, uh, V1, 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 V0, and V1, V1 only, all populations align on a single temperature. So perhaps the H2 emission is a coronary excitation. Uh, as a possible uh, explanations, uh, H2 emission is a result of shock, C shock, perhaps shock, PC shock, a result of the shock interaction with dense AGB shells. So through this H2 analysis, uh, I estimated the, uh, I roughly estimated the hydrogen density of neutral shells. And this is a nebula abundance. The, I compare the observed nebula abundances and the theoretical AGB model result. The sky blue band is our observed elemental abundances, and blue is the result of for blue and red is a red circle is a result of AGB model result. Uh, 2.25 and three solar mass star models. The observed elemental abundance uh, can be explained with both uh, AGB models. But I expect iron. I, iron is uh, perhaps strongly uh, depleted because a cloudy model with a solar iron abundance model uh, predicts so strong iron nebula, abundance, nebula lines. Below figure is the result of these models. Uh, red line is a cloudy predicted synthesis spectra, and gray is the observed spitzer Spectra. We can see the strong iron line here. But indeed, we didn't detect any iron emissions in uh, observed spectra, yes, uh, optical spectra and the harsh spectra. And iron is very important coolant. So I need to set an accurate uh, iron abundances. Then this PN uh, is very similar to ring nebula. So I adapted the iron abundance of ring nebula. The important preparation is to determine the distance. I assume that uh, this object uh, uh, is evolved from uh, 2.25 solar mass, 2.25 to 3 solar mass stars, and also this planetary nebula is uh, similar to ring nebula. And likewise, the uh, ring nebula, this object is still in a cooling track. So, I scale the flux density of synthesis spectra to match the observed uh, uh, flux density. And then uh, I uh, simply, uh, by simply integrate the flux density, and then I obtain the uh, luminosity, function, uh, luminosity function as a distance and effective temp temperature. And uh, then uh, I compared the theoretical uh, post AGB track, and then I obtained the distance is for 460 parsecs, and also the, the, the range of uh, the luminosity and the effective temperature. Yeah. This is my uh, model approach. As fitting constraint, I use the uh, 18 feet flux density and uh, 65 line flux and 35 band flux. And the ionization band radius 
is uh, 55 uh, arc seconds estimated by optical nitro uh, nitrogen two lines. And nebula abundance is, I adapted the calculated elemental abundance plus minus three sigma. And also uh, for the unobserved elemental abundances, I adapted the result of, uh, of uh, Caracas 2010. And the isotope ratio is uh, 20, is from the Bachelor et al. to 1997. For uh, central star, I used uh, Lauch's uh, theoretical stellar atmosphere, and uh, the assuming this planetary nebula is uh, very similar to a uh, ring nebula, I adapt to the uh, same the surface gravity uh, 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 directly measured in the stellar absorption in the ring nebula, 6.9, and uh, solar mass, solar metallicity and the, the range of effective temperature and the luminosity is here. And the radial uh, hydrogen density profile is from to reproduce the observed radial, uh, nitrogen, uh, radial electron, electron density profile uh, using the Herschel uh, Pax, uh, Pax uh, spectra and the its uh, uh, conditions that as I, mentioned before, that this is our mind the adopted hydrogen density profiles. So up to the 54, 54 arc seconds, the constant of this density, and, then in jump, and this point jumped up to the nine, this density, and the, the, and the neutral density is, uh, I said, the one ten thousand cc. And also, the, uh, I adapted the higher uh, cosmic ray background and reference to RA at 2001. And geometry is the cylinder uh, from the uh, CEO velocity map. Of the, and I add the uh, amount of us carbon grains and the pH. And but the stop calculation. I stopped the calculation when the model uh, flux density at one, 170 micron, I uh, reached or exceeded the observed uh, flux density at the same fluxes. And then I, I finally I got the uh, model result as shown in here. The red lines of the uh, predicted the SED of the cloudy model. And, uh, Blue circle is the uh, observed photometry point. And then I obtained the, uh, uh, finally obtained the luminosity and the effective temperature. And gas mass here, gas mass and the dust mass is here. The first question is uh, uh, how much uh, dust mass uh, is from power component? It's, this is very uh, you know, <coughs> rough estimate. When I try to uh, fit the uh, uh, data up to 36 micron, uh, the, the, the dust mass is this. And then uh, I try to uh, fit the, all the data, the lines, the dust mass here. So roughly, roughly estimate the, uh, the, the dust mass uh, is about the 40 percent of the total mass is from a pyre dust component. But I emphasize this, uh, the, this estimate is still is a rough estimate, so I need to uh, check again. Yeah, here is a zoom in the fitting result of spectra in the Spitzer wave lengths. I match the resolution of synthesis spectra to match to the Spitzer spectra, Spitzer resolution ones. The same the red lines the cloudy model result. I highlighted the position of the molecular hydrogen lines here. But in this model, I exclude the 70.3 micron. Fluxes. So 
and also there are no strong iron lines um, in find in the solar metallicity models. So you think that the fitting is seem to be good, but I'm, I should mention the difficulty of the H2 line uh, reproducing. Uh, to reproduce the H2 uh, line fluxes, an extra heating source is necessary. I tried to uh, three trials. One is a central star, on, star model, central star only, and the cosmic ray heating and uh, X-ray heating. But all, mo all model cannot recover the observed line flux. It's, it's line fluxes. So I show the flux emissivity, volume emissivity map of uh, H2 9.66 micron is this figure. Horizontal is uh, gas density and uh, vertical is gas density, gas temperatures. The peak is around 1,000 Kelvin. Uh, this temperature is uh, almost consistent to the observed H2 ex uh, excitation temperature. So, Fortunately, we look at the highest H2 emission regions in this object. So we set the flow temperature in PDR in the reproduced H2 fluxes. When I uh, set the flow temperature model, temp flow temperature, I can reproduce the, uh, the ob observed line fluxes. This is. Uh, this is a normalized uh, flux, normalized flux, and this is uh, the case of the with uh, the flow temperature, and this is a uh, with flow temperature cases. But this model, still model, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I still think that my model is very optimistic because this is, this is a H2 emission images. So H2 lines could be emitted from the gas density clamps, uh, but uh, please note that this, this image uh, field stars are not subtracted. H2 lines could be could emit from the high density clamps and they embedded the smooth gas density. So in this model, I constant feeding factor. So in, in this my cloudy model, I can't reproduce. Uh, so in, with the cloudy model, it, it, it is uh, difficult to reproduce uh, its fl line fluxes. But if I can design the feeding factor uh, manually, maybe the, I can reproduce H2 fluxes. Uh, this is a uh, Herschel Spire band result. Uh, I indicated the position of CO and the CO starting line. So this is a summary of the, this uh, fitting. The H2 is here, uh, the observation, the models. The result of OH plus the fitting result is maybe OK. But the OH plus is a model is overestimate. It's, I think it's due to the uh, adapted higher cosmic ray background. So, still, still that is problem. But the, if we can obtain the ionized molecule lines using by the 
molecular line survey. Mamija. 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 The excitation diagram is a thermal collision. The progenitor mass is uh, 2.25. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe if, if you the distance here yeah. and the estimated gas mass and the dust mass here. And my uh, derived the gas mass is consistent with the ejector mass uh, during the last thermal pass in the three solar mass. Uh, by uh, predicted by uh, the Caracas 2010. <laughs> and uh, about 40% of the total dust mass uh, is from uh, fire component. So, and the, finally, the, uh, this, is a, this, this study is to maximize the observed uh, data and the, the use of cloudy. And then I I understand that cloudy is an uh, excellent code to understand uh, the condition of the hot uh, central star and nebula and dust and gas uh, molecules and the PDR. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this very nice talk on dust. Wait. If anyone else has a question they want to ask first. Okay. So it's a very really nice talk. I think we can explain exactly why you fail to reproduce the molecular hydrogen um, line intensities with your model. It's because you're using a, presumably a static cloudy model. Whereas in these evolved large nebulae with clumps, where the ionization parameter is small and the, the radiation is quite hard, then it's very important the advective terms through the, um, the dissociation front and the ionization front, and actually produces a merging of the dissociation front and the ionization front, and then the molecular hydrogen is not destroyed by the usual Solomon process, it's destroyed by photoionization, by collisions with electrons and protons, and we have a, a paper from 2007 and we applied this to the helix and I think that you, it would be very interesting to apply it yeah, to yeah. Your, your object. Thanks, Will. Another question, comment? How old is this planetary nebula would you, from the expansion age? Expansion age is uh, the same, uh, same as uh, the nebula. I, 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 about the, I estimated the chemi uh, kinet kinematical age and evolutional age. The both age is consistent with the ring nebula. The about 10 to 10,000, hmm? 9,000 to 10,000. The, the, the funny thing about planetaries is so short lived, they're always so young. And the, the chemistry network is pretty ponderously slow. So it, yeah. it, it, you might check whether, the, whether it's had time to come to equilibrium or not. It, it's, uh, it made things like other parts of the network may be worse than, than Will was saying about the advection of the H2. But these are, these are surprisingly young. It's seldom in astronomy we deal with things that are so, so short-lived. Another comment? Are you angry? OK. So thanks. That's and we will thank all the, all the speakers of this morning session and we will go for the last lunch of this cloudy meeting. We will come back here at quarter past two. Thanks a lot.
Sí, ya lo sabes. Qué bueno que no A ver. Tienes la presentación acá. No, no. X Live, X presentación. Ok. Le dices aquí en Acro, debe decir Acrobat. Ah, ya. Ya. Listo. Ahora la quiero cerrar. ¿Qué? Aparece otra vez esto. Mande, doctora. Hola. Este que estaba puesto ahí. Es de Manuel. Pues Manuel no lo quiere. No lo reconoce, dice no es el mío. Vamos a guardarlo vamos a aquí, vamos a preguntar, y lo porque efectivamente lo, estaba en su charla. Sí. Y después yo me quedé con él y Entonces, todos los demás nos quedamos con él. Probablemente sea de, de Silvia, pero es que cuando yo llegué, llegamos los tres juntos. Ya está. Y Manuel ya lo estaba conectando. Y que por eso sus luces. Pues él buscó en su bolsa y dice, no, si aquí está el mío, este no es mío. Bueno, ahí que se queda, a lo mejor es el sitio. Okay. Pero sí estaba desde el principio. Aquí se queda. ¿Quién lo reclame? No estoy... Gracias, Charmaine. Se agradece la intención. Después de todo el día vienen apretando un pinche botón. Pues sí, nos está grabando. No fregues. Ah, ya me va a regañar. No está gusto. No Acabamos. Acabamos. Ese, ese güey cree que. Shoot, flash. Pinche carne, lo me hago. Este. Lo único que hace y ya Quit. se siente saturado. Quit y se acabó. Es una bola de pendejos. Es una bola de pendejos. Luego viene el pendejo, el cabrón. Pues está bien. Yo soy el único chingón aquí. Vamos a coger. Pero eso sí, yo digo, come. Ah, <risa> 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 Pero bueno, ahí estamos. 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 Ahí estamos.